hello and welcome. It is indeed that time again here on Citanium Mind to talk about every game I played from the year from best to worst. The year this time being 2023, which as many of you might know, was a pretty banger year for video games overall. And so we do have quite an extensive list here. I will make a couple little caveats that there were some games that I didn't play enough that I really felt I could rank them at all, and I'll be doing a supplemental video about that soon. Uh, and then there was also some that I originally was going to put onto this list, but they're student projects, and I want to talk about them in another video, but I didn't feel like it was right to to try and judge them in in a list. Uh, they they are indeed free student projects, which I think are interesting to look at. I suppose that this is um, every game I played from 2023 that I felt I could actually put on a ranked list from best to worst. So let's just get into it. But before we get to number one, I need to talk about a game that transcends category. Birch Simulator cannot be categorized. There is no number you can give to it. It is a game where you get to experience the joy of being a birch tree. You even get to go to the moon and Mars as a birch tree. And you get to fall off of Mars as a birch tree. Where am I supposed to put that in a ranking? I don't know. It's everywhere and nowhere all at once. <laughs> Birch Simulator. I think it's like a dollar on Steam. It'll be like 20 minutes of your life that you'll talk about with your grandkids. That's something. Okay, so... Number one. Best game of the year. Probably not going to surprise many people, because everyone's already said it. But it's Baldur's Gate 3. Um, I have gotten... Some of the way through Baldur's Gate 3, but it does not take long into playing where you realize that this is the best adaptation of Dungeons & Dragons that a game studio has ever done. It is the most fully realized version of Dungeons & Dragons, and it is the kind of game that lets you really take like characters that you might have made in the game, if you're familiar with it at all, and really pop it into the scenario that feels like a living, breathing world that has really rich, fleshed-out characters. They do so much at Larian Studios here, like they did with previous RPGs that they made, really utilizing the environment and encouraging you to try out the different systems in the game to, to utilize it. You know, okay, so you have a bad guy and he's standing at the edge of a cliff face, Normally in these games, uh, you would just have to either pick a fight or try to negotiate down with them. But if you have somebody with a high enough strength, maybe you can throw them off the cliff. Try it. See what happens. You can try out all of these different systems that you don't necessarily uh, know about or know that will actually affect the entire storyline going forward. Uh, setting things on fire, dousing out flames, all sorts of great stuff. And... They actually implement the Roll20 mechanics so that you, uh, you have this sense of chance to a lot of the encounters that you do. Uh, I really liked the uh, NPCs that follow you. Your, your party members are all very interesting, rich storylines. They all are indicative to the plot line. Uh, the game looks great. It sounds great. Even when you're in the character editor, hearing Down by the River playing in the background just adds to the sweeping aspect of it. They just did an absolutely fantastic game. It is the kind of game that I had to put down to play some other stuff, but it is something that I am going to go back to, and I imagine that I am going to enjoy for many, many, many more hours to come. Okay, number one from this year was probably not going to be a big surprise for most people making lists like this. Number two is where things get a little bit more interesting. And number two on my list is Lies of P. You know, I don't always like Souls-like games, but when I do, I really do. Lies of P, I believed was going to be probably too hard or too technical for me to really enjoy, having played the demo. 
Uh, but then when we got to the actual game and I, I played that, I realized that they had done a lot of just balancing and adjustment to make it more accessible in the early parts of the game so that they could really get you into the meat of it and really ramp you up for what was coming next. Liza P does a really good job of onboarding you by showing you that this is difficult and that this can be technical and that there are some serious dangers around every corner and that combat can be kind of fast and kind of fluid and you have to know about it. But at the same time, giving you these really interesting systems past that about like changing out your handles and your heads, uh, about working on like legion arms and upgrading different aspects of what they call the P-organ so that you, you get additional stats that lead to larger stats. And this leads to some really fun builds that you can make, a another aspect that you don't always see in Souls games. And it does a really good job of incorporating all of this together. Uh, it also looks great, has a really interesting setting, and... If the teaser that they give you at the end is any indication that NeoWiz is going to make another one of these with an, another famous like uh, storybook character, I'm going to be very interested for that. I really loved it, enough that I could play through it entirely and then come back and uh, do New Game Plus, which I, I almost did an entire New Game Plus because I, I needed to jump back immediately on it. That's, that's why it has to rank so highly. It's very rare for me to experience that. Number three is an untold gem. No one was going to bring this up at any Game Awards, but I really wish more people would talk about it. It's War Tales. I've talked about this before. I've done videos about it before. War Tales is really good. It's just really good. You get to build up an entire team of nobodies from the very beginning in this kind of like, not real high fantasy, but, you know, fantastic-ish medieval setting and have this moral ambivalence of how you deal with every scenario that is given to you. Do you want to help the refugees or do you want to help the establishment folks that are in the camp? Uh, you can do one or the other and it's not really made clear which one is the morally correct one. You can do either. Hey, the bandits have stopped a caravan of traders. You can help the traders, but you could also help the bandits if you wanted to. There's a lot of interesting choices like that throughout the game, and the game just reacts to the choices that you make. Uh, it also has this really interesting mechanic where it lets you build giant teams that you are going to take into these turn-based, almost XCOM-like battles, but... It also tells you that you can have that giant team, but it is also going to require more resources in. You're going to have to pay them more, you're going to have to feed them more food, uh, and so that's, that's going to run into more resources to maintain the army that you're essentially building of individual characters. You have to outfit them all so that they don't die, and if they die, it's over. You know, uh, there's, there's a lot of really great stuff in it, and it really holds your attention. Um... It only starts to really lag in later areas where you realize that you have so many people on the field and it's turn-based that the, the battles drag down. But until that point, you don't have really any problem playing the game, and I, I really appreciate that. Okay, number four, Dead Space remake for 2023. Uh, I did not finish the original Dead Space. I made it fairly far in and then just kind of got bored. Uh, I got tired of it, and I think one of the things was just the tanky controls when it originally came out. I wasn't in love with the way that it was presented to me, nor was I all that fascinated with, like, Dead Space 2, and I did play Dead Space 3 to the end because it was more of an action-y game, and I guess I liked that, but man, this remake of that first game, it still gives you the action that you might have appreciated from Dead Space 3, but they do so much to make the experience more enjoyable, from the way that the interface and the smoothness of movement and the ambient design of the, the clanking of the ship and the distant howls and, and the clicking on and off of light, it just gives this atmosphere to it that is undeniably 
excellent. Draws you right into the whole experience. The way it's lit, uh, the little details all across the world, the way that they even do zero gravity, the uh, way that your guns handle, uh, which I think, you know, I'd have to go back and play the first one again, but I, I really felt far happier and more satisfied with the way everything handled. And I even liked the changes that they made to the node system, where you can upgrade different aspects of your suit through nodes rather than specific upgrade stations. It really works great, and I finished this one. Like, I, this, this was the first time I've finished Dead Space, and it was the remake, because it was just so well done, so atmospheric, and draws you through the game entirely. Uh, really great. Glad I got a chance to finish it. Number five is Hi-Fi Rush. The only reason this is not higher on the list is because rhythm-based beat-em-ups is not exactly my genre. But I really appreciate everything that this did, from the time that it was shadow-dropped and I tried it out, to going back to it almost a year later to try a few more levels. The thing that hits you immediately is that the soundtrack, the look, the animation is so top-notch in this game. It's amazing that this wasn't promoted for years past, but I'm really glad that they did. Uh, this is very different for Tango to make this game, considering like Evil Within and Ghostwire Tokyo were their games before. It's a completely different vibe, but it's a welcome one. It plays great, too. Uh, and I love the idea that your attacks will always hit on the beats, but actually hitting those beats is where you get serious damage. So it doesn't break up the flow of combat like you would see in some other rhythm-based games. Uh, your flow still goes on, even if you're not hitting perfectly. But you start to realize hitting perfectly has many more benefits. They have the tag-in, tag-out system with some of the other characters that you meet. Uh, where they will have special abilities that you can exploit. And the fact that the entire world, as you start to notice around you, is on this beat along with you. Uh, everything is moving to a certain beat. is just brilliant game design. Really excellent. Just really excellent design. Number six, Bone Razor Minions. As many people might know, Vampire Survivors was my favorite game from 2022. Bone Razor Minions kind of takes that and says, what if we did this thing where we, we did Vampire Survivors, right? But we do it in some, some smaller arenas that are more like tower defense arenas where we can set down traps and stuff. And then also, we don't attack so much as we raise an army of minions that are going to attack our enemies for us. That would be pretty sweet, wouldn't it? And it is. It is actually pretty sweet. I can't tell you it's as good as Vampire Survivors. I don't think it's as good as Vampire Survivors. But it is a really good twist on the formula, and you get to be a necromancer, which is pretty great, too. There's a bunch of different arenas that you unlock over the course of time, and I did find that I skipped a, a lot of them to try and move on to the, the new hotness uh, quicker, but that doesn't stop the fact that it's a, a really good take on that, like, reverse bullet hell genre that emerged out of Vampire Survivors. A lot of fun, if you're looking for a follow-up. I find the SteamWorld series to be very charming in the mainline games that it made, but it's been kind of branching out into some other genres, and SteamWorld Build is one of them, creating more of a city builder. The thing that's really interesting, though, about SteamWorld Build is that it's very well automated. Which is to say that when you put down buildings uh, and you put down different quarters for, you know, the scientist community and then buildings for the scientists and stuff, they, everybody knows where they're going. The pathing is almost automatic. And so it feels fluid in a more satisfying way and a less micromanage way than a lot of city builders. But then the really interesting thing about it is that there are levels underneath. In similar fashion to how the first couple SteamWorld games had you digging down into this, this world and uncovering and mining, 
they do that in this as well, with several different levels of mines that need to be shored up and need to be excavated to get more resources so that your buildings up at the top can actually produce new stuff. And so there's this interesting multi-leveling of your city building that you have to do. You have the city above, and then you have several levels of mines that have to be maintained so that you can unlock new things, so that you can create new buildings at the top that allow you to dig down even further so that you can put your spaceship together. Uh, and it works really well. It is very streamlined uh, and a lot of fun to play and uh, even has the very charitable ability to move around your buildings without having to deconstruct and rebuild them. Uh, it's trying to be less heavy-handed and uh, less in the weeds than other city builders, and I think it succeeds at that. Atomic Heart came out at the beginning of the game, and people kind of saw it as Bioshock, but in, like, Soviet Russia an alternative version of Soviet Russia. And they're not wrong. I wouldn't say it's as good as Bioshock, any of them. But what was really interesting about it was the world building that they did and how it was very open-ended. This is a very open world version of something like that, you know, alternative history, what-if scenario sort of thing that Bioshock did, and it, it works pretty well overall. The uh, The main character is kind of boring, honestly, uh, and says crispy critters way too often, but the, but the fact of the matter is that uh, they do a really interesting job with the upgrade system for your character and also for all of your weaponry. Uh, the, uh, the enemies are pretty inventive, a lot of robots, basically a lot of androids and robots, and uh, some other, like, bio-monsters that you meet later. There's some very interesting story elements, a lot of environmental storytelling as you go through these labs, especially the labs, and meet more characters throughout the game. It is something that really did hold my attention and that I wanted to explore further, and I did finish the game, which is a big plus. I can't tell you that I felt as satisfied with the conclusion as I did with, you know, um, the stuff that Irrational has put out in the past, but good effort all around. Really appreciated. <sighs> I don't know how this got so high up on this list, but I just got addicted to it for a while, and... That counts for something. It's, um... Ship Graveyard Simulator 2. I can't tell you that this is a particularly deep game. It's actually not a deep game at all. Uh, what it is is basically... Put a ship on the dock and try to pull it apart. It actually has far more similarity to, uh, like, a hard space shipbreaker. Although I will note, hard space shipbreaker is a much better game with more intricacy in how you're supposed to, you know, work this ship, and uh, much more streamlining in how you actually process the ship. Uh, but what Ship Graveyard Simulator does really well is uh, allow you to kind of go at your own pace. There's no time limit or anything on it. Um, you don't have to worry about dying or anything. You can uh, play around, tool around, throw everything in the back of your truck, and then process... Uh, all of your scrap, and complete a bunch of missions so that you can get better and better tools, and there's like 10 upgrade levels to, to all of your gear. And uh, that gets you up to like the warships where you're just tooling around this warship trying to think to yourself, hmm, what's the first thing I really need to do here? Okay, I gotta clean up everything that's on the decks. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, well now what do I need to do? Oh, well, uh, I, I need to take this deck apart and see if I can actually cause the rest of this to collapse. Oh, but wait, I need to make sure that the electrical is off and I need to make sure that the, the gas is off and all of that or it's going to explode different parts and I, I need that money. Uh, so it gives you that game loop of really dissecting these giant ships toward the end and uh, really trying to suss out how you're going to do it effectively. Uh, and it's a time sink, I'm not going to lie, uh, but it's a, a very enjoyable one. has a lot of issues that hopefully will get worked out in the future and doesn't feel nearly as rich as some of the other games that are similar to it. But um, boy, howdy, once you start playing, it's just hard to put it down. 
it's it's one of those. It's like Tetris, but with taking ships apart. Number 10. Very cool. It's on guard. Uh, you know, originally people kind of thought on guard was similar to maybe like a Souls-like game. It was uh, something I saw Iron Pineapple feature in his other Souls-likes that you haven't played. Unguard is actually nothing like a Souls game. Um, the only things that are similar to that genre is that it does have like combat gameplay where you need to learn how to parry and thrust and all of that. Uh, and yep, that's pretty much that's pretty much it. The fun part though is being able to like kick guys into your know, weapon racks and toss buckets on their heads and it's all done in this beautiful cartoon art style with a real tongue-in-cheek sense of humor to it it looks really good it plays really well i can't tell you it's particularly long there's no like upgrading or anything so it's not particularly deep in like character development but what it does well it really does well which is this the general combat and the fun level design that you move through in more of a linear fashion. I really wanted to give it some props here because I think that they they did a really nice job for as like small and independent a game as it is. Surprisingly enough, it's only here at number 11 that we even get into the cozy genre because we're going to talk about Homestead Arcana. And I did like Homestead Arcana. I'm going to talk about some of the problems that I had, but in general, the look and the feel of the game is great. I love the art style that they give to this. I love the, you know, very mellow background music and thematics that they do. Um, I love the character designs. I really like the idea of being able to put on a Plague Doctor mask, go into this uh, just miasma, as they call it, and have like this this time limit of how long you can be in there before you pass out and all of your equipment falls on the ground and you got to go reclaim it. Uh, dealing with these mystical monsters that are in there that you don't necessarily kill because you don't have those kinds of skills, but that you definitely have to find workarounds. All with this framework of being, you know, like an alchemist. Uh, and uh, trying to create potions and stuff so that you can power your special abilities. And that's really neat. Uh, and then once you actually cleanse an area of miasma, you get to ride around on a broomstick, which is also cool. Uh, the problem really comes in that it, it also really loves the minutia. If you plant a tomato plant in the ground, it will continually grow back. But in order to harvest any of the tomatoes from it, you have to click on the plant itself, and then you have to maneuver through the different branches and leaves and cuttings to get to each one of the tomatoes and pick them off. Because you can also do pruning and stuff like that, which is, it just feels like that could have been streamlined way easier so that I just, I just want all the tomatoes. <laughs> just give me all the tomatoes. Similarly, if I have to get 20 of an item to somebody for a request, I can't just take 20 of the items and put them in one of my little pigeonhole slots. I have to put each one of the items in each one of the slots and select them from the list. It's just why they wanted to do that kind of game design where it just becomes tedium that never needed to be there, I don't know. There's a lot of streamlining that could have been done in the game. And ultimately, that's where the problem comes, is in the tedium that they give to the game slows it way, way down. And it's unfortunate because overall, the game really feels nice when you're in the game part, but not in the other random stuff that you're doing as chores. <laughs> That's not so much fun. Pseudoregalia is a Metroidvania that is done in like an old PS1 style, and you might not necessarily like the retro style, but let's face it, you get to be a goat girl with a staff, and that's pretty great. The thing that just drags this down is not the gameplay, which is nice and fluid and fast and really helps with exploration. It's not even the combat, which is very rudimentary, but it works just fine. The one problem with this game that really drags it down at all is traversal. Uh, because if you do what I did, 
and play for a while and go, ooh, this game is a lot of fun. I'm going to come back to this later. And you come back to it later, you will not remember how to get anywhere. And the game does not really do a great job of explaining what you're supposed to do in that moment, how you're supposed to get to the place you need to get, and the path that you take to get there. So for returning customers, you are going to have a really difficult time. That does not mean that the game is not good. And I am very glad that there are more of like these Metroidvania kind of style games out there because it's one of my favorite genres. And I think that overall, it does a really nice job in more of the like Tomb Raider look and feel that they give to this game. I really want to give props to the folks that made it, but be aware that uh, it can become very difficult to actually figure out where you're supposed to go and what you're supposed to do if you have stepped away from it for any period of time and forgotten what you were doing. Uh, the game will not help you. Okay, we're at number 13, and that means we, we have to talk about Starfield now. Starfield is a mixed bag. I think everybody kind of knows that. On the one hand, I played this game for over 100 hours, and I did not do that because anyone told me I had to. I did that of my own volition, and I do not regret it. On the other hand, uh, it is a lot of just stuff. It's throwing the kitchen sink into a game, and just interacting with everything. Is it is it an RPG? Well, yes, it has RPG elements. It has sub-quests. It has side quests. Gee, is, is it a, a, a base building thing? Oh, yeah, there's base building in the game. Don't worry, you can build your ship, too. You can do ship building. Uh, you can do crafting in this game. You can do pretty much everything. You name a system that you would think of that could be in an RPG, it's that. This is a Bethesda RPG. It's set in space. If you like Bethesda RPGs, you're probably going to like Starfield. If you uh, like space games, you might like Starfield just fine. Um, but it is not like a No Man's Sky or a Elite Dangerous in the way that it's framed. I didn't necessarily like the way that they did the open world elements because it felt very vapid going from space to ground it doesn't feel fluid. Uh, you, you actually have to like go from one interface to another and back in different loading screens. Even though there's so much here, even though there's a lot that you can see and experience, even though there's a lot of different stories and factions and things to do in the game, even though there seems to be a lot of lore and history in Starfield, it still feels vapid and shallow when you're playing it. So it is a mixed bag. I did play for a very long time. I think that counts for something. I think that some of the systems in the game are more engaging than others. I unfortunately don't think it's as good as other Bethesda games at launch. And that's unfortunate. But if you do like Bethesda games, you will probably like Starfield, but I can't guarantee it. And that's a real shame. <laughs> to be honest with you. As you can probably tell at that juncture, we're getting away from the really great games that I played into the okay games, but I will say that even as we go further, even when we get down to the very bottom, it is surprising how few games I really didn't like at all. Uh, and more or less, you're going to see that I, I just found some to be underwhelming or disappointing which kind of speaks to how good a year 2023 was for games. Palea is a farming life sim kind of game that you play online. You play with other players. It's supposed to be more of like a what if, what if Stardew Valley, but an MMO. Really interesting idea. Have not seen that done before, but it does a really good job of showing off at the beginning that they're serious about this world. It's It's got a really strong art style. It's got a really nice personality. A lot of interesting people to interact with. A lot of neat characters. Uh, and a lot of different survival and crafting sort of mechanics that you go out for. Uh, you can mine stuff. You can chop down trees. You can hunt animals. You know the score. Uh, you upgrade your tools. And, uh, you know, set down your farming plots. 
water them religiously and you're you're probably going to be okay. I think the thing that eventually got me off of Palea is that because it has to be like this online game, everything is on timers. You water your gardens and you, you know, start getting your different workbenches loaded up with stuff to do. And then you just kind of have to sit there and wait for things to finish for sometimes very long times, sometimes hours that this stuff is going to go on. And so you're like, well, I guess I'm going to step away and come back later. And what I found is that at a certain point, you don't really see much value in going out and even exploring the world. You just kind of pop in for five or ten minutes water your garden, collect everything that you've gotten out of your garden, and then go, all right, I'm going to bounce, and then come back, collect that, mostly just to get gold. And at that point, you're like, well, what? what's the point of playing this game? I think that there can be more substantial stuff. It definitely looks like there's stuff that was supposed to be in the game, areas that are not accessible at the moment, that are going to be in there eventually and if that happens good right now it's fun for a little bit but it's not really fun for any length of time remnant 2 is a game that i was looking forward to because i had played from the ashes remnant 1 and i i really did like it at first i didn't and then i came back played it again and it is famously one of those those games I did a, a complete 180 on and realized I really do like this. I, I like the kind of like Dark Souls with guns, even though a lot of the levels are randomly generated, which is definitely not a Souls-like characteristic. Remnant 2 seeks to take that formula and expand upon it, and it is for better and worse. The gunplay is still there, which is good. Um, the uh, the enemies are still there, and they still look like weird root monsters, and I like that, as well as some, like, rogue drones that come after you. You know, some really interesting stuff. You start out in this one big village that can be, like, your hub area, and you uncover uh, new fast travel points. You also have the ability to, like you did in the first one, have an adventure mode and a story mode that you can do concurrently with each other so that you can go and fight alternate bosses and everything like that. Very neat stuff. Very cool. Can also be very frustrating because monsters will just like come out of nowhere, it seems like, or mob you uh, in the middle of a dungeon, which uh, I wasn't as thrilled about, but I get it. Like That's what happens. Uh, but the big problem that I had with Remnant 2 is that they, they tried to make it a lot bigger and a lot more open. And when I had played the first game, the areas themselves were small enough that it was easy to figure out how to traverse from, from one point to another. In the larger hub worlds that they make with Remnant 2, it actually becomes trickier to figure out where you're supposed to go and what you're supposed to do. You have an objective, but then you have like three different possible locations that you could go to that objective and I still don't really know how to get to the objective in the first place. You'll I, I finished missions thinking, oh cool, I think I finished the main oh no, this wasn't where I was supposed to go. I still can't access this place, huh? I gotta find a different rune. I I don't necessarily know if some of the changes that they made to the game were beneficial overall. I am hoping that this is one that I can also come back to similar to the first Remnant and revisit. Uh, this this would definitely be a good candidate for that. Gloomgrave gets a lot of credit for being different. You are in a turn-based dungeon crawler where there are a variety of different enemies that come at you. The interesting thing about this is that you move in a very rudimentary way. You can, like, turn to the side, and then you can move forward or backwards, uh, and this is pretty much everything that you do. Uh, but the fun thing about it is that you and your enemies only act when you decide that you're going to take an action. So if you're right up next to Slime Monster, you uh, move forward, and that is the point where the enemy will attack you. It's fun because you get to kind of like 
try out these different dungeons, look around them, and they are like randomly generated, very similar to a roguelike. As you go deeper and deeper into this world, you find some other biomes that you can enjoy. It seems pretty intent on giving you an actual box for a screen, uh, so that you don't really have peripheral vision like you do with most screens. But then, in addition to that, you're, you're even when you're turning to the sides, usually half your screen is blocked by some kind of wall. So it's very hard to, like, look around. And it starts to feel very hemmed in, uh, which is also kind of annoying. I really wish that I, I might have had some just freedom of movement so that I could just look around and just peer peer through. But no, literally, your your vision changes immediately when you say, I want to turn, yep, and you've turned. And then this is just the vision that you have. Uh, there's a certain myopia that you get to this game that can feel claustrophobic, and uh, that that I didn't appreciate. I guess it works for the dungeon crawling aspect, but even in big open rooms, I can't I can't even see to my side that there's a character right around the corner that's going to smack me when I move into the area, uh, and that's usually how I died from just stuff around a corner I couldn't see. Not great, and this is the part of the video where we talk about Diablo 4. Yeah, Diablo 4 is also a mixed bag, similar to Starfield. It is both a return to form to one of my favorite games in the series, which was Diablo 2. Uh, it is definitely a lot more like Diablo 2 than Diablo 3 was. Uh, it has a, a, a darker, grittier, more grounded look and feel and storyline. Uh, it has some very interesting characters and development. In a lot of ways, there's stuff to be jazzed about when it comes to Diablo 4. However, Diablo 4 also leans heavily into multiplayer online play with these open world elements of, oh, look, a, a, like a random event happened where there's a boss monster you have to take care of. There, there are random bosses. Uh, and, and so you got to take care of that. It's on the timer. Go, go and get the treasure. Oh, there's a, there's a whisper chest over here. You, you better get the whisper key or whatever they're called. I don't, I don't remember. Uh, but the point of the matter is, is that there's a lot of these kind of like more MMO elements that they added into the game that, I think detract from the fact that they were building this very interesting story about like the Haradrim and and that lore and talking about Lilith and like they they set up these really interesting story things but then they couldn't help themselves and they needed to do open world uh you know MMO stuff and season passes and and, and the loot boxes and everything like that and they they needed to add in all of these things I didn't want that detract from the main part of the game that seemed like it had some pretty good legs. But the stuff that it did more like Diablo Immortal, not good. <laughs> Let's put it to you that way. Not a bad game by any stretch of the imagination, but definitely not Diablo 2. It d doesn't get there. And that's, that's disappointing because it does look really good out of the gate. Arcade Paradise is a mixed bag. I feel like I've said that so many times in this episode, but Arcade Paradise is a mixed bag. It is sort of this cozy simulation game that has really boring parts and really interesting parts. The story has you start out in this um, laundromat. Uh, your dad has you run to try and teach you responsibility. And so what you do in the laundromat is you make sure it's clean. Uh, you take out the trash that people leave around. You uh, put laundry in at certain times, take them out, put them in the dryer, and get them ready for people to come and take. Make sure the bathrooms are clean, all of that. Kind of tedious. But you quickly find out that there's actually an arcade in the back room. And no one has been using it. But wouldn't it be cool if you fixed that up? And then you had the machines run. And if you get really good at the machines, you can actually earn more from each one of the machines. And you could fix that up. And you could expand that place. And you could get even more machines. But the problem, of course, is that even though it's really fun to see like these old school arcade games that you get to play in the back room, you still kind of have to do the laundromat thing. 
And it's a real problem because if you step away from an arcade cabinet when you're playing the arcade games, it takes you back to the beginning because it's an arcade. But your laundry is all on timers. So you have to step away like after two minutes, even though the arcade games themselves are much, much longer. You're still working on timers and, and day cycles and everything. So you practically can't do the games if you still want to do the laundromat part. So eventually you just kind of go, I don't even care if, if I get the laundry done. I'm not even engaging with that part and I'm just playing the arcade games because if I get better at those, I earn more money on the arcade cabinets. And then I can buy more arcade cabinets. So it's, it's weird. If there was an intention there, which there might have been to purposefully have gamers ditch the actual like chore work of the 9 to 5 and do the playing arcade games, I guess it succeeded. But that doesn't change the fact that the game seems to continually make it very clear, hey, remember you still run the laundromat. <laughs> I don't care anymore. You made, like, tons of fun, cute little arcade throwback games. Just lean into that now. Maybe don't have the timers be as egregious. Or why do I have to fold other people's clothes? I don't think that's how a laundromat works. Anyway, the, the point, it's a mixed bag. Cursor Blade is a game where your cursor is a sword. And you use the cursor to, like, run through a bunch of little enemies. It is not deep. It is satisfying and fun and has some cute upgrades to it it is it is an enjoyable little experience it is a, a mindless little uh, game that you get to play for a while it, it's fine it's not deep you will have some fun with it though but there's there's not a lot of substance to it that's it that's all i got hearth's light potion shop is uh like a very light surprisingly enough, game about potion making. Uh, it is not nearly as deep or as rich as other games that you might have experienced that kind of lean into this idea. Potionomics, potion craft, etc. But it does feel very relaxing and cute. And that's what I really wanted to touch on. Uh, you have different customers that come in and have specific requests for things that have different properties. And so then you have to figure out how you're going to brew this thing that has specific kinds of quantities and qualities for the, the customer that's coming at you. Uh, you can't really do things in bulk at all. Uh, you can't memorize how to do specific things so that you can automate it out. It's not that kind of a game. You, you brew one potion at a time, you take one ingredient off the shelf at a time, you take one bottle off of the shelf at a time, you, you give the customer what they want, they're very, very happy, and then you move on to the next one. Uh, there's, there's not a lot of like character development like you might see in a potionomics. There is no like traversal mini-games to try and just get the, the recipe perfect so that you can replicate it ad nauseum like in, in potion crap. But it is uh, a cute enough game that they did they did a nice little job on, and it feels very zen when you're playing it. Wo Long Fallen Dynasty is a mixed bag. Take a shot. What you do in Wo Long Fallen Dynasty is you play a Souls-like game, but you do it uh, as like a samurai, and you do it in in a, a very like fast-paced sort of uh, game where, you know, it really feels like you have to block at the right time, and you parry at the right time, but it feels very satisfying in a way that some Souls-likes don't do, you know? It, it feels feels really nice when you get to do those parries. It, it has nice, tight handling on it, uh, and, and feels like you have more fluid in your movement than you do in a lot of these games. Uh, it, it looks really nice. Well, we'll get to that in a second. Um, and it, it plays really well. That's really the key, is that it has, it has a really good play style. Even your upgrade system, where you have all of these different elements that you uh, can, can edge toward, uh, like rock or wind or fire, you know, and that this uh, can affect the different uh, spells and abilities that you have throughout the game. That's really neat. The reason why this gets dragged down as much as it does is because it is so poorly optimized that even though the game could look really good, chances are your computer can't run it 
without it looking like a potato, and running really subpar, and not having nearly as many frames as you would hope it would for a game that's supposed to be about good timing. And so that drags it down. I don't have the greatest PC, but Lies of P worked fine for me. Lies of P worked fine for me and looked great. How Wo Long looks like a PS1 game when I actually get around to trying to play it is beyond me. It's so poorly optimized. It is is so poorly you know, put out in the state that it was in. And that's a real shame because it, it's got a very strong idea behind it uh, and, and a, a really interesting concept to it. And it gets bogged down real quick by poor optimization to the point that it's down here at 21. Lamplighter League is a turn-based game that kind of has more of a, an Indiana Jones kind of style to it in the characters and the setting and everything like that. And overall, it looks perfectly fine, and I think it functions really well. I just felt like it wasn't as uh, rich an experience as I was hoping for. I think it was trying to go more for XCOM than something that has uh, richer character customization like you would find in a War Tales or, hey, you know what, a Baldur's Gate 3. It doesn't get to those heights. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have a, a, a very nice art style and a look and a feel. The characters are fine. The characters are fine. The design is fine. You're more or less trying to move from point A to point B through each one of these scenarios, doing your cover base shooting and using the special skills of your characters as you go through. It works fine, but I, I do have to say, having talked about some other games that are in like that turn-based strategy game genre that have strong RPG elements, this feels very light for the fare that you're consuming. Thronefall is a tower defense game where you play like a, a little warlord character riding around on your horse and commanding your armies to battle. And through these different rounds, after defeating a wave, you get some money and you can use that to either build new structures or upgrade existing ones. Uh, and um, that's pretty much what you do. There's only like five levels when I played the game originally, and I think that they've added another one in, but it is actually fairly light as in terms of how much content there is overall, and you can tell that they want to expand it quite a bit because when you see the different options you have for starting equipment, weapons, all of that, it, it looks like just a bunch of blank squares uh, where there were supposed to be, you know, things... <laughs> Uh, even if you were to complete all the challenges, it looks like there's a lot of content that they haven't implemented yet. So in its current state, I think it's lackluster, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have something going for it. I was just hoping that it was there when I played it. Blue Oak Bridge is, is Stardew Valley with a different art style and less interesting characters. It doesn't feel like it had as much work go into it. But it has, it has a really nice art style. The art style is really great. Some poor optimization, actually. Um, frame rate drops down real heavily for some odd reason when you're digging. The dungeons are kind of whatever. It's not bad. It's very meh. Sadly, it's meh. There's just so many games that do a better job. Um, Nice art style, though. I mentioned that, right? Oh, nine years of shadow. Oh, oh, oh. This one hurts. So, nine years of shadow uh, starts off real strong. Really, really strong. Uh, it, it presents itself as a Metroidvania title, because I believe that it truly is. Um, and it starts out with, like, literally you in, like, a black-and-white shadow world, and then it, like, the color starts to come into the world, and you get used to the very basic battle mechanics, and it starts to feel really good, and you're like, oh, yeah, this is gonna be awesome! And then the real meat of the game starts, and you're like, oh, come on. One, 
there's a lot of these areas that will block themselves off so they can't backtrack until you defeat whatever the boss is and then like another boss and another boss and another challenge and if any time you die it it will go back to your save game at a point that you hit like a half hour ago i'm like come come on folks can can we not have a few more save locations or just it doesn't even have to be to like just get all of my stuff back. Just, just, just a place where I can do a checkpoint or anything like that. No, no, no. You have to defeat this main boss, and then you'd have to defeat the sub boss, and then you have to go through this whole like water spout puzzle thing that has a bunch of spikes, and you could die at any time. And if any, if at any point you die during this whole thing, you gotta repeat the boss and the mini boss and this challenge and the mini boss that was after it until you can get back to a save point. Uh, and uh, I'm I'm like, really? It just really. I mean, maybe we're spoiled, but that that just it feels like far too much between being able to do one thing and another thing. I was really uh, saddened by this because it just screeches the game to the halt uh, when you start to get into how difficult some of these boss mechanics are to to get around and how they have huge hitboxes, you just, you get deflated very quickly because I got to do, like, all this exploration and stuff just to get back to a point, and then I got to redo all of the exploration in these huge sections of the game over and over again because of a misstep. Really a shame, because it starts off so strong, and you're like, oh, yeah, finally a new Metroid, like a classic Metroid. <sighs> Oh well, not as interconnected uh, as 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 a world as you would have hoped for from the game. Merchant of the Six Kingdoms, an interesting little trading game, but it does have this inherent problem of having to barter, and the the bartering mechanics just start to put a lot of question marks over your head. I don't really know how many, you know, eggs to a hog's head this gets, and there's no real standardized currency. I mean, I shouldn't say that. There, there, There's copper, and there's silver, and there's gold, but trying to figure out, like, how much everything is worth is a little tricky, and trying to figure out if you're even getting a good deal with a lot of these trades is tricky and trying to accrue new product that is outside of your trades is basically non-existent. So you could trade yourself into oblivion without really having an option to get new equipment. And I would have really liked a system maybe like what they had for Moonlighter, where at a certain point, if I can really suss out, you know, like how much in coin this item is worth, the game will just kind of give me a log of saying, oh yeah, this is worth roughly this amount. So that I have an idea of like comparative shopping. I think this is why the barter system died and we now have a standard money system. For anyone who's like, why do we have fiat currency? Just go play Merchant of the Six Kingdoms and figure it out. This is the reason... <laughs> <laughs> this is the reason, because you're always just trying to figure out how much stuff is worth to a coin value, because I can't figure out, like, this this magic pendant, is this worth as much as five sheep? I don't know. I have no clue, and I'm worried about even initiating a trade, because, I, I, like, did I just get screwed? I, I don't know. <laughs> Should I ask for more? Do I have to do to do I have to try to trade with this person 15 times to try and make sure I get the optimal value from him and are they going to get mad and walk away? I don't know. I don't know the worth of everything in this world and I'd like to find out. I'd like to discover that, but they never really explicitly tell you even when you start to like be able to make trades that feel fair. Um Yeah, it's it's a frustrating experience. A cool idea, but a frustrating experience. Ravenlock is uh, a game where you, you fight mystical enemies and stuff, and you solve little puzzles uh, by collecting this object so that you can access this place. And it's fine. I don't think that it's terrible, terrible, but it's really lackluster. It really ends up becoming that, oh, collect these five things so that you can, uh, you know, get help from this person who gives you this item that you can then unlock this next area from. It is definitely geared more toward, I think, kids, like smaller kids. Not necessarily the experience that I would be looking for. I think that it 
it has you know a, a nice enough tone to it for a younger demographic but for me uh it did feel like those continuous fetch quest to get to another fetch quest to get to another fetch quest and that's not that's not particularly interesting while the iron's hot is a small little pixel game where you get to play as a blacksmith this would be a really great idea it would uh, if they don't bog you down in the minutia of actually doing that because in order to smith anything you have to put the different items in exactly the right configuration in your mold similar to like what you would do with minecraft but you have to put them in there and then you have to do like a mini game to try and get rid of all the things that are not the item itself so that you can get a quality item and then you have to do that for each individual item even if you need to like make a bunch of them could i just make a bunch of shovels and then sell shovels well, you could make them individually by going through this whole process. Can I automatically just say, yes, I would like to make a shovel now, and it will just, if I have it in my inventory, it will just put it into the thing? No, no. Uh, you you got to manually put it all in there. Sorry, sorry, kid. You thought you'd get out of this easy? There's nothing that can turn me off of a game faster than if you bog me down with mechanics that could have been streamlined very easily in the game. And when you start to realize that the general quest line is just, um, this person needs a sword. Make them a sword. Cool, now you can get across the bridge because you gave this person a sword. This next person needs a knife. That's like the whole game. Oh. <laughs> uh, not bad, but kind of boring. This is the part of the video where we talk about Redfall. Redfall is, well, it's not really a mixed bag. It It's... It's fun for how hilariously bad it is. It's fun to watch the bugs. It's fun to watch, like, the T-posing vampires. To just see the vapid interactions you have with various characters around the firehouse. It, it's, it's fun for, you know, the silly things that it does that don't make sense where, you know, characters will just not interact with you at all, or just kind of, like, stare off into the distance while you shoot them in the back of the head. It, like, it's, it's that stuff that's fun. But overall, yes, it is not a good game at all, and I am very, very sad, because Arcane is such a good studio, <laughs> and has been for a very long time, and this is subpar to the quality that I am used to from them, and I'm so sad. And, and why, why this happen? Why? This could have been an interesting idea. Vampires, open world, arcane, like, does really good jobs at making worlds that are, like, the immersive sim. You could, you could do more of that, but this is not very much of an immersive sim. This is, a, this is an open world uh, going around and trying to shoot vampires game, and it doesn't even do a good job at that, and I'm very sad now. <laughs> I'm sorry, Midnight Acres. I'm very sorry. You had a very interesting idea. What if farming game, but also tower defense game? Neat concept. Points for trying something new. No points for trying two things that do not really go well together. I don't refund a lot of games. This was one of them. I cannot tell you how annoying it is to have this this one little period of time during the day to try and build a little bit of a farm only to just watch at night for this endless cadre of enemies to come and just wreck everything and do it all again each single day to defend this one mystical seed that you have on your property. It is uh, annoying. Very annoying. And that is the way that I would frame it. And I am sorry, Midnight Acres. I know you tried. You tried to do something interesting. It just didn't work. But that's not actually at the bottom of my list. No, surprisingly enough, Redfall, Midnight Acres, none of them. They're not at the bottom of my list. And even the last one on my list is not necessarily terrible, but 
I don't know what happened here. And that's the last case of Benedict Fox. Um, the last case of Benedict Fox is trying to be sort of like a Metroidvania game, but it really doesn't achieve that. The idea is that you're playing Benedict Fox and you're going into this manner to discover mysteries about the world in what is sort of a, I don't know, H.P. Lovecraft inspired kind of, you know, eldritch horror sort of theme. And it seems so neat, right? And it looks so cool. This could be really great until you start to play the game and you realize that, you know, the idea is to go into this shadow realm of the monsters, the, the, where the old ones live, the cosmic horror, so that you can uncover clues to how to solve mysteries in the mansion. Um, and that a lot of this world is really blocked off to you. Uh, sometimes for no real reason, except you can't open the door now. And the biggest design problem that I had, because there is combat in the game, is that you don't have a lot of combat abilities. You have like a knife that you can use, I think, that you can use for, for melee, and you do have a gun. And at first I was like, oh, okay, well then you have ranged attacks and melee attacks. But they did this weird thing where when you shoot your gun, you only have one bullet for your pistol and in order to recover another bullet you have to do a melee attack so this kind of defeats the idea of having a ranged option because i gotta do a ranged attack but then i gotta figure out a way on the thing that's like flying all over the place that's doing these giant area attacks i still gotta get in to do a melee attack just so i can get bullet back so i can do a one hit for it. I didn't like this design at all. I, I, I really didn't. And I realized, too, that there are puzzles that are in the main game that, realistically, if I looked something up online just to find out what the solutions to the puzzles are, I could have probably passed most of the game by entirely. I, I don't... I don't like the layout of this at all. And when I got to the first boss battle, and I was like, I, I have so little idea what's going on here as to what I'm supposed to achieve, and these giant waves of energy coming across, I, I was like, nope, I don't like this, I don't like this at all, it doesn't feel good, it doesn't play well, I don't, I don't enjoy this, and it's really, really saddening, because like several of the other games that I've talked about toward the bottom of this list, and it makes me sad. <laughs> this, this, this looked like it could be a really great game. It is not at all. I had no fun playing this at all. That was a lot. That was 31 games. That's not even all the ones that I that I didn't play enough. There's been so many games. We'll talk about that later. But in the meantime, I'm going to go sleep. Because it, it took, took a while to play a lot of this stuff. As you might know, the reason why these kind of don't go out at the very beginning of the year is because I'm still trying to play catch-up and play some of the games that came out in 2023 in, like, January. Because so many of them come out at the end of the year, and I need to get to them, and I want to put them on the list. Um, so thank you for bearing with me. And there'll be a couple supplemental pieces to this, and I hope you come back for that. And we will see you next time on the Citanium Mine, and um, I put some rocket boosters on that mine cart. So, um... When you when you leave, you're you're gonna not be back for a while. Uh, whoop! Told you. <laughs>